welcome to our weekly webcast of the Objector Church. We are a religious humanist community that focuses on peace and social justice issues. And we have this weekly webcast each week as a chance for members of our community to connect with each other, to learn a little bit, to be inspired, and to hopefully be empowered to do good in the world and make the world a little more peaceful, a little more just. In each of our webcasts, we try to do three things, the three I's, inspiration, information, and interaction. So for this week, we're hoping interaction will be scattered throughout this, this, uh, this episode. So if you have comments along the way, please post them on Facebook Live. We'll be reading some of those along the way. Encourage you to uh, join us as you can. Again, we want this to be some real interaction. So the interaction happens throughout it, but for the other parts, inf inspiration, information, we're breaking this into two chunks for this webcast. The first part, inspiration, will be dealing with a topic that might not sound inspiring at first glance. The topic is mourning. I promise this is not a Debbie Downer episode. I'm actually going to be talking about how that the effective use of mourning is an important part of what it means to be a human. So I encourage you, uh, join us for that. We really want to have some lively conversation, a lot to be said on this subject. Secondly, we'll be talking about for our second part about the idea of podcasts. In particular, I'm going to recommend a few, and I'm hoping that those of you watching live will have some of your own to, to recommend as well. By the way, uh, hello, Paul, for joining us. Uh, kind of excited you're joining us because you're a real radio person, so uh, a true radio professional. So very excited you're joining us. Um, I'm just an amateur at uh, podcasting and radio and whatnot, so I'm quite honored you're with us tonight, Paul. So anyway, though, we're going to get started into our topic of conversation. And again, just one last reminder, please feel free to post comments. And if you like what you're hearing, hit that share button, share it with your friends. So uh, as far as our topic, the first part of this tonight, we're talking about the subject of mourning. This has been on my mind um, a lot over the last 24 hours because yesterday I attended a funeral. It was a funeral of a relative of mine, someone who died tragically too young. And all funerals are sad. There's no way around that. And it was, um, you know, like all funerals, there's moments of, of happiness, of happy memories. There's sad moments. There's tragic moments. Full range of human emotions. But what struck me about this funeral, and not just this funeral, but many funerals I've been to, is that there's something very awkward in the air. And what I mean by that, I'm specifically meaning in our culture here in the US of A, and more broadly, probably in the West generally, but specifically in the US of A. And that is that there is this sense of, mm, what would be the word, well, just awkwardness, because mourning makes many of us feel uncomfortable for a lot of reasons. And I would argue that there's some reasons for that and some reasons I think that are not terribly healthy and helpful to us. The first thing I would mention is, is that the way that people die today has been corporatized, and it is antiseptic, meaning that most of us, after someone has died, even a loved one, we ourselves are not tending to the body. We're not cleaning the body, getting it ready for burial. Rather, professionals do it very skilled professionals who are good at separating us as grievers from mourners from what's happening. So there's that, this professionalization of these very natural biological things have to happen before someone is laid to rest. Um, and I, but I also think that there's something about the whole funeral industry that has basically served to separate people from the reality of death and to to really put up walls, uh, barriers there. But there's something more than that, and I think some of it has to do with religion. And, and bear in mind, I live here in the US of A and the great state of Oklahoma, and religiously, Oklahoma, while we have a lot of diversity in some ways, religiously, the dominant religion is Christianity, and the dominant expression of that Christianity is evangelical Christianity. And evangelical Christianity, I'm going to grossly generalize right now, um, and I realize there are, there's tons of nuance, tons of diversity within evangelicalism, but with this gross generalization in play, I would say that for many people in Oklahoma who 
in this evangelical Christian culture, mourning funerals, memorials make people very uncomfortable because there is a great deal of emphasis in the theology of the hereafter, of heaven, or sometimes talking about hell and the fear of that. But primarily a focus on the hereafter. In other words, our life here on earth is often de-emphasized, made less important. What is to come is more important. So how does that play out in the context of a funeral? Well, is there room for mourning when you believe that the departed is in a better place? Isn't it kind of selfish to mourn? I've heard these things expressed before. This almost this idea that if you mourn, if you struggle with loss, it's because you lack faith. That's the problem. And I've, I've heard this said in nuanced ways. I've said, heard it said in blunt ways. But this concept is there. And what it does, it creates a level of awkwardness and disease or unease. But then what about after the funeral? What about the grief that comes later? Our society has very little tolerance for that. Most employers, they might give you a day off work, a couple days maybe for a funeral, but are they gonna recognize that losing a loved one is something that might affect you for some time after that and you might need some extra care? No. What about religious communities? Many religious communities, again, after the immediate passing has happened, a lot of people end up being more distant than in anything. There's very little space or room for grief, and that's a problem. I want to argue today, and again, our context here is religious humanism. We are seeking to deal with the big issues like traditional religions do, but we're trying to do so in ways that as a community reflect all of us, reflect the diversity of our community and the fact that we all come at this in different places. And so I would argue that the modes of mourning that the dominant culture has given us are not so helpful. Now, the good news is there are some different ways of doing mourning from other traditions. And my family, we've come to appreciate a lot of Judaism in this, pra in this way because mourning is a central part of Judaism. And I didn't really fully understand this until I started attending regularly a Jewish synagogue and realized in every single Shabbat service, there's the mourner's Kaddish, a special prayer that in more traditional communities would be read or recited by just mourners. In a more progressive community like we attend, it's read by everyone collectively. But the idea that every week there is space for mourning, and that there's a roadmap for mourning. For, for family members, for those who are most touched by grief, there is a roadmap of things that are done, that are done as a part of mourning. And I, I find this to be a very helpful concept. Um, I would argue that our failure to have this, this space for mourning, leaves many of us with unfinished business, psychologically and spiritually, that we are left often not having the space to truly grieve when hard times come. And because there's a lack of space for that grief, it keeps bubbling up. And so my, my, my argument is, is that some of these traditional ideas, such as in Judaism, do give us some roadmaps, give us some helpful tools. So what about, though, if you're not Jewish? What if you are turned off by traditional religion? And there's plenty of good reasons to do that. I would say that there, there's, we need to th think about what would mourning look like in our context, in a different context. By the way, before we go on to, to this talking this morning, I want to welcome some of the new other people who have joined us. I have Caleb, um, Rebecca, my wife, and Anya De Marie have joined us. So thank you, everyone who's tuned in tonight. We really appreciate it. Just a reminder, we'd love to hear your comments. Particularly, though, I want to pose a discussion question tonight, and I want to, want to ask, is there some time that for you was meaningful that you engaged in mourning? It could be for a family member. It could be a friend. It could be for someone else important in your life. And we're going to talk about that more in detail in just a little bit. But if you have some time like that in your life that you want to share, just a few lines, a paragraph, but to tell about what made that time important to you and what did you do or engage in in your morning process. Uh, so I want to throw that out there if folks have thoughts along those lines. 
But while we're doing that, I want to share an article, and I'm going to post the link here. And, and uh, Serena, who's with us tonight on in, in our comments line, she shared this article with me, and I really was found it to be very helpful. So I'm sharing the link here. It's from the Atlantic Monthly. And the article is titled, Enter the Grief Police. The internet is allowing return to age-old communal forms of mourning. That makes some people uncomfortable. And this was written by Megan Garber, January 20th, 2016. Anyway, this article makes some interesting points. I'm gonna talk about it just briefly and we'll read a few excerpts from it. Uh, in fact, I'm going to read this. The first few paragraphs are really kind of helpful, so we're going to read this. It says, The First World War transformed, along with so much else, the way people mourn. The British anthropologist Jeffrey Gorer argues that the death of so many people in such a small span of time overwhelmed those, who, those they left behind and rendered them unable to undergo the rituals that had previously been in place for grieving. Combined with the rise of psychoanalysts and its emphasis on the interiority of the individual, and it gives examples of Freud's mourning and melancholia, presented grief as a highly personal phenomenon. The social practice of mourning was transformed in the early 20th century, just to the extent that by the 1960s, Gore was describing grief as something to be kept, quote, under complete control by strength of will and character, so that it be given no public expression. Today, that tradition continues. Grief in the popular imagination is a sadness to be experienced and carried and borne as silently as possible and as stoically as possible. And yet mourning, too, has a public face, condolences, wakes, the sharing of memories and sympathies. That juxtaposition leaves many confused about how to celebrate the dead, how to comfort the living, how, in short, to grieve together. Quote, rituals used to help the community by giving everyone a sense of what to do or say. Megan O'Rourke put, put, puts, puts it in her magisterial memoir, The Long Goodbye. Quote, now we're out to sea. Goes on, though, this article talks about that for many people, that what they've done as their way of grieving has been to turn to social media and the internet more generally. Sometimes it's for uh, friends or family members, members of past and using the internet as a tool of expressing memories and reflections. For others though, um, it comes in the context of mourning people that may, we not, may not personally know, but we have been deeply touched by. And, um, and I'm gonna read a little bit about this subject because I think it's quite interesting. It says, Grief policing was on display recently during the aftermath of David Bowie's death. Camilla Long, the film critic for the Sunday Times, witnessed the outpouring of emotion posted online as people learned and tried to make sense of Bowie's passing. She did not like the way they mourned. The grieving she suggested, or well, quote, grieving, unquote, was for her self-indulgent and like so much else on social media, purely performative. A uh, Bowie blubberer, she called the grievers. And I'll read you some other some some of the quotes that she said. Uh, she said, "This is Camilla Long in her blog or her Twitter." She said, "After several link tra lengthy trips to the vomitorium today, I'm now rather dreading what will happen on social media when Paul McCartney dies." Someone else, uh, some, another of her posts said, "So many people crying are in bits over Bowie." And then she uses the F word um, and then says, you're not 10, you're an adult. Man the blank up and say something interesting. She literally said this. Now, there was thankfully some outlash, some pushback. Um, and there was um, a lot of critics who said that this was totally out of line. And yet, this has come up again and again, and many people, when they see the mourning for David Bowie, the mourning for Robin Williams in the generation before of John Lennon, these were major moments in time when many people mourned the passing of someone significant to them. And yet, there are critics who say, no, that's the wrong kind of mourning. Well, this is just me, my own take on this, but I'm not too happy with that concept. I think we need to be much more open to the fact that people will mourn as they need to mourn, and it looks like different things for different people. And we don't just need to internalize it, bottle it up, but rather we need communal outlets to express 
morning and what we feel. And so I think that there's something significant, for instance, when someone mourns and expresses in a public way how they feel about the loss of a central cultural figure in their life, a musician, an artist, a writer. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I think there's something very positive and good. And certainly when it comes to our loved ones, we need the space to mourn. And so I don't have the answer right now for our community. With the Objector Church, we are seeking to provide the kind of rituals and meaning that traditional religious groups uh, provide for our members who have a wide range of theological perspectives, broad range of philosophies ranging from um, atheists and agnostics to people that may be more traditionally religious but are turned off by exclusivism. We have a broad range of ideas within our community. But I would like for us to begin exploring what would it look like for us to mourn? What do we, what's, and what space do we provide in a given time, a given week, a given month, a given year, when we ourselves may personally not be mourning, but someone in our, else in our life is? What can we do to mourn with them, to be in solidarity? So those are the questions I have. I uh, want to mention, though, if anyone has any comments or questions, uh, please feel free to post them. Sometimes my Facebook thing doesn't, I don't see this. I'm hitting real quick to make sure I don't have any comments before we move on in the conversation and some other things because I'm concerned maybe I may have missed some. But to mention if you have comments, but particularly about the subject of mourning, maybe a time that mourning, uh, the practice of mourning was important to you in some way, um, please share it. I'd love to hear it and we can re read it and talk about it. So. We'll give it one more moment. While this is doing, I want to mention, um, while this is loading, I should say, I do want to mention that the Objector Church, we have a website. You can find out more about us at objector.church and lots of information there. Um, okay. So I got a comment here from Serena Blaze. She posted, the peak of the AIDS crisis was a period when large numbers of people died in a short time. The LGBT community was a heavy where a heavy impact occurred was in constant mourning. In some cases, because of the shame around the disease that was present, family members had to suppress or at least hide their grief. That's a, I'm really glad you shared that, Rena. She also shared a couple of others. She, uh, Rena posted, sometimes artists have such an impact on us that their loss is a huge sorrow, especially when the death is unexpected. When John Lennon was murdered, it was the first death that caused me total grief. I felt it physically, and I went to group events to share the grief. Thank you so much for sharing that. Rene, one thing that struck me when, when, I was, uh, when you shared that with me, I was thinking about a series of books that I adore. The Tales of the City books by Armistead Maupin. And I, in a future episode, we may just have a, an, an episode that just talks about these books. They are incredibly important in literary history, in my, my opinion, certainly um, uh, LGBT uh, history. Um, Armistead was one of the first mainstream authors to talk about the AIDS crisis, to, and he also really did a fantastic job of bringing for straight Americans the reality that gay people and the whole spectrum of orientation and uh, identity, that at the end of the day, these differences are not that different. In other words, human beings are human beings. And when you read his books, he did an artful job of pulling the reader in and of helping them to see past their own prejudices. So anyway, though, all those to say, Armour said Maupin in his books, he talked about what two of the main characters talked about uh, John Lennon's passing and talked about how that they're, they were reminiscing about a previous point in life when John Lennon died and talked about how they went to a group event, just like what Reno was talking about, and that people did this. Uh, all over the world, that people felt the need to, to not just grieve privately, but to come together, to be present with other people. And I think this is something that our society has mostly lost. In most settings, again, funerals, memorials, all of that is institutionalized, separated from the people who are actually doing the grieving, and we're all kind of off, off by ourselves. I think one of the awesome of the internet is it's actually bringing down some of these walls. It's giving people an outlet for their grief that they might not otherwise have. Okay, another comment I have here. 
from Rebecca, my wife. She says that when my grandmother died, I worried that her funeral would basically sideline many basic parts of her life and personality that, that had been denied and not tolerated by the rest of my family. I offered to give her eulogy and the process of reading all of her letters and diaries and trying uh, to get to know her more fully and find a way to express her as a whole person was healing to me in my own grief and taught me much about my own life. Also, another comment from Rebecca, she says, I think that in my own life, the deepest grief that I have ever experienced has been the loss of beloved pets. Their deaths were so deeply painful and brought up so many other kinds of feelings of loss and shame and guilt. This is the kind of loss that no employer and few families and friends can even acknowledge and yet can be so life-changing. For this kind of loss, there is no good ceremony or liturgy or path to follow for guiding grieving towards healing. I have to agree on that. Um, I can think of um, the losses of some of my pets over the years, um, incredibly traumatic. And, uh, and I don't think that we're alone in feeling this. I think there's a lot of folks that feel this, but again, as communities, as a society, we really don't provide much space for people to be real with these emotions. So I don't know, I guess that's really what comes down to for our community, Objector Church, I want to make space for that. And so speaking of that, and we, by the way, we continue this conversation, encourage you to have more comments. We'll come back to this conversation in a moment. But we normally, throughout our time together, we normally light a candle as an expression of hope and a little bit of ritual that we do that's something that's fairly universal in nature, something that many people can relate to. And so I wanted to light a candle. But tonight I'm going to light a few candles, and I actually want to share, show off something, and it's covered with candle wax here, but I'm going to use it tonight. This is a special little candelabra, I'm actually technically a Hanukkah, because it's, it's designed for use for the Jewish uh, festival of Hanukkah. It has little spots for eight candles, the one candle in the center, the helper candle, the shumash that lights the others. And what's cool about this is that this was made in India by craftsmen there who made use of an old bicycle chain. You can see this very well. And I don't use it very often because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit um, wobbly. But I'm going to use it tonight because it gives me the chance to light some extra candles. And we're gonna, I'm going to light three of them. And what we've done in the past is we've, we've had uh, lighting candles as an expression of hope. And there's a little blessing that I read. It's from the Book of Blessings by Marcia Falk. Um, and it's in the Jewish, uh, more humanistic tradition. But I read it as an expression of intention setting and of hope. For tonight, though, um, we'll light one of the candles, as we always do, just as an expression of hope for what we hope for the world, of yearning for peace. But the other two candles, I'm going to challenge you, if you're watching this, to think about someone that you honor, someone that's passed on before you, but that you appreciate and that you value. And we're tonight lighting the candles in memory of those people. Um, so uh, again, challenge you to think about who you'd want to remember tonight as we light these candles. And I'm going to do it this way because my... This particular lighter isn't. So again, a couple of these candles are a memory of people that are dear to us that we're thinking of tonight. And then the last one is, is uh, just a reflection of our hope for the world as it could be. And then let me go ahead and read this blessing. But again, in reading this, I'm also particularly thinking about not just what we yearn for ourselves, yearn for the world to be different, but also to think about those who've gone before, what they've contributed to bringing us to this place. By the way, just a reminder, I do the first part of this in Hebrew, the rest of this is in English. Shema kavara la'olat alafei panim melo alam shakinata ribwe paneka ekad. Hear, O congregation, the divine abounds everywhere and dwells in everything. The many are one. Loving life and its mysterious source with all my heart and all my spirit, all my senses and strength, I take upon myself and into myself these promises. To care for the earth and those who live upon it. To pursue justice and peace. To love kindness and compassion. 
I will teach this to our children throughout the passage of the day. As I dwell on my home and as I go on my journey from the time I rise until I fall asleep. And may my actions be faithful to my words that our children's children may live to know. Truth and kindness have embraced. Peace and justice have kissed and are one. And our closing words of this blessing, I'll just say, just a reminder, thinking about those who've gone before us, those who've helped us to be better human beings, those who've helped us to see things differently, that have challenged us, who have loved us, thinking about them tonight. Okay, I have, um, oh, hello, Bert. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, also, uh, Barb is with us. And then I have a few comments. Um, uh, Rebecca says, I want to Loa, honor Lois Fisher. And Serena, she posted, I'm thinking of Christine O'Brien and Dana Whitehurst, two dear friends and great activists who died too young. And for myself, uh, who I'm thinking about is Sugar Thronesberry, um, someone who's dear to our family for a whole bunch of different ways and who died way too young. And I'm also thinking about, um, yeah, I'll just say Sugar. I'll be thinking about her tonight. So, and again, by creating the space, we're acknowledging that this is a part of life. But part of this acknowledging of grief, acknowledging of sadness is also creating space for healing. And I think one of the challenges from a psychological standpoint is that by not ever addressing grief, by not giving ourselves the permission to be in that place, then we don't ever really deal with things and instead it becomes unfinished business. So one of the things I want to uh, throw out there for more conversation and thought, and we can pick it up tonight if folks have thoughts on this, otherwise we'll talk with this a future time, is a question I have is from a, from a religious humanist perspective, looking at things, rituals, practices that can be meaningful to many different people in different contexts. I wonder what would be a good way, a path of healing from grief or through grief. In the Jewish tradition, again, there are some patterns there of uh, reciting the Kaddish of various rituals and practices, but that's kind of particular to one tradition. I'd like to look at what are traditions, ideas that we can do that are more broader, that would be relevant to people from a variety of different traditions and backgrounds. So if you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them, share them in the comments here. We can read them over, over the webcast. But also if you just wanna shoot me an email, that'd be great too. My email is james at objector.church. In time, I'm hoping that we can have some written materials, guidance that'd be helpful to our members and friends on this subject. So, okay. Um, we'll check one more time for comments. Sometimes, again, this is, um, it's the internet. What can you say? Okay, so we're going to go ahead and move on now from this topic, but um, thank you so much for all the thoughts. And again, if you have thoughts throughout the rest of this program, we can always come back to it. So um, the second thing we'll talk about tonight, though, is of a more, um, well, it's our information time. And specifically, I want to talk about something that I think for many of us makes our lives better and that is good quality audio content to listen to online that informs us, that inspires us, that helps us to feel a little bit less alone, a little bit less disempowered. And so I wanna share a couple that I find meaningful, but I'm also hoping those of you who are watching, if you have something that's meaningful to you, please share it. So first of all, I wanna share a brand new podcast and I'm really excited that the creator of this podcast is with us tonight in the comments here, uh, Serena and her podcast. And let me real quick pull up the address for it. Uh, it's called Peace Buzz. And Peace Buzz has been around for a while, uh, but his was, on hiatus for a bit, and Rena has now revived it. And Rena, I am trying to find the link. Uh, if you have, okay, uh, the website is peacebuzz.net. Thank you, Rena. So peacebuzz.net is where you can find uh, the episodes. And this has been going on. She started this um, back oh, a few years back, did quite a few episodes uh, up through about 2017. 
but now she's revived it. It's going to be coming out every other week, and I am super excited about this because basically, to me, what this does so well is it serves as an effective activist filter. And what I mean by that, if you're like me and you care about a lot of different peace and social justice issues, it's hard to stay informed without completely getting depressed and losing your mind. And um, we can't do that because we've got work to do. So what, Pe what Peace Buzz does so well is it filters all the drowning mass of information and filters it down and gives us uh, just what we need to know, but also gives us some active action points of what we can do. And so, for instance, her most recent episode, and this is the February 14th issue, um, she talked about one of the big stories was, of course, the, the Conscious Objector Registry with the Objector Church. By the way, if you aren't familiar with that, go to our website, objector.church, and I believe it's slash registry to find out more about that. But if you want to learn more um, beyond that, again, tune in to Peace Buzz because she talks about it. But Rena also talked about in this last podcast uh, some information on Black History Month with a look at the civil rights icon Clara Looper. And again, Clara Looper and our history in Oklahoma of resistance segregation, in many ways, this was very early on before the lunch counter sit-ins took place in the parts of the country. Um, so um, again, um, really good stuff about Clara Looper. Also, she talks about some of the uh, events addressing the growth and rise of NATO in a new way, the attempts of the United States to decentralize the government in, in Venezuela, uh, issues of nuclear proliferation, and discussion on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution, the Green New Deal. There's so much good stuff in this episode. And so I encourage you to check that out at peacebuzz.net. And I want to throw out something very specific I want to ask all of you out there watching. If, you're, if, can, if you can have a chance to listen to her podcast, Rena has asked me for feedback because she wants to create a podcast that will be engaging and helpful. So please, if you listen, Look on our website, peacebuzz.net. There's that button that says feedback. Please click on it. And, I, and I'm, this is, I'm saying this because it's, it's also it's something I've experienced. When you work hard to create good content, you don't get feedback. It can be kind of discouraging. And so she needs to know people are listening to motivate her to keep doing this, but also just to make it as good as it possibly can be. So please check it out. Um, it's a really well-produced, very thoughtful podcast. I'm a fan, obviously, so please tune in. The next uh, thing I want to share is a podcast by the name of Tapestry, and it is produced by CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Company. Their normal host is Mary Hines, and um, I'm going to post a link to the show right on our uh, Facebook chat we're having. Uh, you know, theoretically, I was going to do that if it will let me... Okay, so the link to Tapestry, I'm posting it right here at CBC, and it's cbc.ca slash radio slash tapestry. And um, this is a fantastic program because it deals with, in fact, I'll just read how she describes it, Mary Hines. Um, their website describes it as, Tapestry exists to go deep. We investigate the messy, complicated, and sometimes absurd nature of life through the lenses of psychology, philosophy, religion, and spirituality. Tapestry is your radio slash audio home for all the big questions. Why are we here? What does it mean to live a good life? Will the Leafs make the playoffs in your lifetime? We mix it up with professionals who think big thoughts for a living and ordinary people just trying to make sense of the world. Tapestry is hosted by Mary Hines, produced by Aaron Noel and Rosie Fernandez. And of course, on the podcast, uh, whenever you please. Anyway, I really, really like... Um, Tapestry. I've been listening for quite a few years now, and I'm a big fan. It's just to kind of give you an idea of the kind of pro uh, programs. Um, I'll read you some of the, the recent stories in the last. Um, here's one of the headlines. Performing naked can be a radical act for men, says Ryder. Another one. Fat and loving it. This man says life improved when he gained weight. And then finally, the tyranny of beauty standards and the men who fight them. Um, in previous episodes, um, she's talked about religious differences, religious conflicts. One of the episodes I really found meaningful, she talked a few years ago, she, well, actually, she's a few times she's talked to people on the autism spectrum and talked to them about how religion works for them and doesn't work for them. She, uh, a few years back, she had an interview with a Baptist pastor 
um, who had become an atheist. And what did he do when his marriage and life and career was all a big question mark due to a change of just what he believed? Uh, anyway, she, she just has so, so much, so much interesting stuff. Cannot say enough good stuff about this podcast. So again, I encourage you to check it out. Another thing I wanted to share, and again, if any of y'all out there um, have thoughts of things you like, um, uh, please share them. Um, but then we'll go back and read some more comments we have coming in. Um, Jeff um, Patterson says, sorry I'm late. Look forward to watching the edited version in a couple of days. And by the way, for those of you who do watch the recorded versions, Jeff is the one who makes my uh, jumbled uh live episodes a little bit more cohesive and put together so appreciate all of his hard work i have a comment here from rebecca she says i have come to believe that the best way to mourn an individual is to find some piece of their life work that has been left undone and finding ways to continue uh, that work forward supporting a cherished volunteer program or completing an unfinished project project or caring for or providing support for a loved one that they have left behind i like that a lot also, Rebecca later post commented, she said, I have listened to this week's Peace Buzz. Great job, Serena Blaze. Loved hearing more about Clara Looper, such a great American hero and an inspiring Oklahoman. So I'm hoping though some of you out there have some some people, some um, podcasts or content you find helpful or inspiring. Uh, I'm going to share one, and it's going to take me one moment to pull this one up. But um, I have learned about this through my wife, Rebecca, who you've heard comment some tonight. But she uh, has got me hooked uh, when I can have the time to listen to some of the online sermons um, by our local imam here in Oklahoma City from the Islamic Society of Greater Oklahoma City. And uh, you know, our imam's name, his name is Dr. Imam Imad Inchasi. And so if you want to find, hear some of his sermons, I'm going to put a link here to them. Um, and um, the imam, what I really like, by the way, if you're looking for them, if you look at their website, towards the center of it is a Friday uh, kahutba. I, I may be, I'm probably for sure mispronouncing that, the Arabic. But on here, if you click here, the audio library of past uh, Friday uh, kahutbas, sermons, and special talks. So click on that, and that takes you then to a huge library of sermons. And a couple things I like about the imam's messages. Number one, and I think most importantly, it gives non-Muslims the chance to discover that their Muslim friends are not that different than them. They deal with so many of the, uh, of the same issues that their church or their temple or, or their other community deal with, dealing with real human issues. In other words, there's a lot of paranoid, scared, racist, prejudiced people out there. There's a lot of Islamophobes, and I can't help but think that a lot of the Islamophobia could be lowered about 20 notches if they just take the time to listen to some actual Muslims, such as our imam here in Oklahoma City. So these messages are great. Also, what I like about the imam's messages is that he manages to do two things at once. First of all, he hits hard at challenging his community and all his listeners to be better people. But secondly, he means to do so while at the same time having a sense of humor. The guy is hilarious. I think, I frankly think if he uh, wasn't an imam, he would have had to have been a stand-up comedian because he's that funny. He's really good at what he does. And I, I listen to him just to learn the, the, the craft of writing a good uh, religious talk. The guy, he's just phenomenal. So highly recommend. And my wife, though, she loves him because she listens to him when she's, she's a doctor. She sees her patients part of the day. And then later in the day, she has tons of medical charts to review that all doctors do. And so what she does to just have something encouraging, uplifting to listen to while doing this is she listens to the imam's messages, among others. And uh, I really have been challenged by what she's done to kind of inspire me to think, what can I do to make a part of my life that may be challenging and tedious, maybe a little bit better? And podcasts give us the chance to do that or other content like this. Okay, I got another comment here from Serena. She says, my podcast list is all political. I need to branch out, but I love podcasts. I say cut the cable cord and just listen to all the great podcasts. By the way, a lot of cable news shows are available as podcasts. 
That is an excellent point. Podcasts save money. Uh, one podcast I listen to video and audio forms at times is Democracy Now! And I love it, but right now I don't know of any low at least in Oklahoma City proper, there aren't any radio stations playing Democracy Now! on a regular basis. But I love it that I can tune in anytime I want uh, through video and audio online to listen to Democracy Now! And there's lots of other programs like that that are available. Also, while I'm thinking about it, I do have to mention for sure that as um, that for our um, for the objectors, which we have several of our own podcasts, and we're in the transitioning those to a different hosting platform. So there may be a few wrinkles to work out. But right now, our weekly webcasts, they are normally available archived in video and audio form anywhere from a few days to a week after broadcast. We try to get them out as quickly as possible. We also, though, have some special podcasts from the Objector Institute, our uh, educational wing. I have several new episodes. I just got to finish editing to get uploaded there, but are experiencing Dao class that discusses the Dao De Ching. We have two new lectures there. We have a class that's talking about the, um, the Book of Psalms, but from a religious humanist perspective. Um, so we have a lot of, and we're going to have some more content over time. So I encourage you to check all of those out. Okay, any other folks out there watching, if you have ideas of podcasts, online content you want to share, um, this is a great time to let folks know. And also, after our live webcast, if you have stuff that you want to share that's important to you, uh, please feel free to add it to our comments. We may do this podcast wrap-up thing or um, oh, a recommendations program again if we get some more good, good content. Anyway, I think unless we have some more comments, we're about to close off our time. Just want a couple last little bit of announcements. Uh, one thing I want to mention is we have a couple of big shows coming up, and I have not decided for sure on the timing of these. And to some extent, it's going to depend upon you. Those of you watching and listening, to give me some thoughts on what you want to hear sooner or later. One of the programs I have in mind, and I have some people I'm going to be leaning on to help me with this, but a podcast on the spirituality of science fiction. I'm super excited about this. Talking about, of course, Star Wars and Star Trek. There's so much there. But I also want to talk about, and do I have a copy of it? Yes, I do. A fascinating book I discovered. Uh, the used bookstore, Isaac Asimov's. Asimov's Basic Guide to the Bible, the Old Testament. Now, Isaac Asimov is fascinating. He was uh, eth ethnically Jewish, but religiously, he was, as far as I know, was an atheist all of his life. Um, but he was still interested in, um, in Ju Judaism and the Bible more generally. And his argument with this book, uh, he basically argues that for a lot of Christians and Jews, all they know about certain times of world history are found from the Bible. And the problem is the Bible, um, the Jewish and Christian scriptures have a, um, a very biased perspective based upon its own theological views and whatnot. Um, nothing new, by the way. This is part of you know, human existence and all. Um, but his argument is, is that by putting the Bible in a historical context and unearthing its biases and being also looking at the role of these texts in the context of the rest of the ancient Middle East and how the myths and stories of other peoples around them shaped the biblical stories. And I just find it fascinating. And knowing Asimov and all the things he wrote about over the course of his life, you see these issues of spirituality come up. And I'm also thinking about Ray Bradbury. There's so, so many others. And so I want to hear from you. One, how has science fiction shaped your spirituality or sparked thoughts about your spirituality? Do you have good science fiction authors to recommend we delve into? Particularly, I want some leads on good female science fiction authors who deal with issues of spirituality. I have to admit, I'm unfortunately pretty male. A lot of my science fiction writing past has been of male authors. I want to read more female science fiction authors. So if you have recommendations, Please, 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 sending them to me. Okay, got another comment here. My wife says, oh, man, are you mentioning sci-fi for me? Yes and no, because I actually think it's a great topic. It's not just for you, but yeah, yeah. I, 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 in fact, I'm hoping to have you on as a guest on camera for this one if I can talk you into it, because there's just so, so much here. So the spirituality of science fiction is coming. I'm not sure. Maybe next week, maybe a future week. 
We also, another thing I was, I'm going to give a teaser for, we're just waiting to hear about when our guests can be on, but the Objector Church, our educational wing, the Objector Institute, a court, we have made a couple of nominations for Nobel Peace Prizes because according to the rules of the Nobel Peace Prize, that, that professors of theology, among other things, are entitled to send in nominations. And since we are teaching graduate level theological education, we thought, why not? We'll send in our nominations. And so I'm going to be announcing those on a future uh, broadcast of the our live uh, webisodes. So uh, we have some more information that I'm trying to make, just make, make sure our guests are lined up to talk about our honorees. But we have two very important organizations we'll be sharing about in future episodes. So that's coming up. But also, if you, beyond these topics, there's probably other things that you might be thinking about, things you would like to have explored in, in our conversation. So if you have something, please send it to me. I'd love to hear from you. My email is james at objector.church. Last thing I want to mention is, is that if you like what we're doing, if you, if you want to support what we're about, please visit our website, objector.church slash donate. Your financial donations are critically needed right now. Um, and again, this is very uh, biased on my account because I like getting paid for my work. And so those donations make it possible for me to keep doing this and dedicating the time I'd like to. If I was doing this purely as a volunteer, it'd be a lot harder to do. And so again, um, I just think we're, we're, we're about some good things. And I think our community, we have a lot of potential to, to make some changes in some good ways and to provide some solace and help for people uh, that need a place to connect to, even if they're maybe turned off by traditional religion. Oh, speaking about community, I do want to mention um, we do have an Objector Church Facebook group for our members and friends. And this is a place where we can chat and support each other. Um, if you're watching this on the face, uh, Facebook Live, I believe it's in the comments above um, that gives the link to this. But if you're watching this, I encourage you uh, to, join, uh, to join that group. Oh, go, yeah, look for the last comment from Serena. There's a link there to the group. But if you like what you're hearing, please um, sign up as a member of that group. It's just a place for us to have a little more uh, personal conversation. We might want to have in a purely public venue. So anyway, um, last call for comments, questions, etc. before we uh, call it quits for tonight. So, well, thank you everyone for joining in. Don't forget, please share this with your friends and you can watch it immediately right after this will be available recorded format on Facebook, but we'll have a much nicer edited version um, in a few days. So. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll see you same time next week. Bye now.